All right, so tonight we are going to look at systems and structure development. As you know that uh, we started last week and uh, I would like us to please So I would like us to be conscious of some of the things I'll be saying. Uh, I may not have the whole time to explain in detail. So during question and feedback time, you should be able to ask so we can deal with some issues. Uh, first and first, we're going to understand what is a system. And what is systems thinking? The benefits of systems thinking, the systems building blocks, rules for effective system, and the 3C of teamwork system. Then we'll talk about system maintenance, and I will conclude hopefully tomorrow. So quickly, let's ask a question and answer it. We talked about the creation story, how God created the heavens and the earth. And, and every one of us understand the story in Genesis that God created systems. He created the solar systems. He created other systems. And the question we try to ask, why did God create systems? And um, the reason is so that God will have time to rest. In a place where there is no system, there is no rest. Where there is no system, there is no rest. So, so it's very important that we create systems. So God created the planetary system. God created the solar system. If I may ask, why do you think God created the solar system? Can somebody reply? Why did God create a system for solar? When we talk about solar system, we're not talking about solar light. No. Talking about the sun, the moon. You know, God created light. Light was the first thing God created. He said God said, let there be light. And there was light. Thereafter, God created other things. So I'm asking, why did God create light? Does somebody want to answer? Yes, please. I can see a hand up. It's a precious, please. Yes, I think he he did it so that the planets don't collide. Okay, that's the planetary system. So God created it so that the planets will not collide, so that there will be order, so that I won't be walking, and uh, Adam Adam will be walking and 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 put his leg in a ditch. So that, so that there will be orderliness. Thank you, Ma. So we also going to understand that God created respiratory systems to solve respiratory problems. God created reproductive systems to solve reproductive problems. God created digestive system to solve digestive system problems. God created nervous system to solve a nervous problem. God also created a leadership system to create order on earth. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we saw where the Bible says God created man to have dominion. Genesis 1:26. So God made man in his own image and likeness for man to have dominion. So 
systems are created to solve problems. So if you want to solve problem, systems creation is important. Now, what is systems thinking? Uh, systems is different from system thinking. The system is a structure. Systems thinking is understanding how systems work. So the definition says, it is a process of understanding how things influence one another within a whole. So if you belong to a system where things are done in a certain way, when you understand how your role influences other persons, it means you are a system thinker. Now, from the image, you can see uh, the guy on the red plug will not be able to receive power without the guy on the blue plug or the guy on the blue socket. So it's called male and female. So in, in thinking, the guy on the red plug knows that he needs the guy on the blue blue socket. So what we are saying in essence, that a system thinker is that individual that knows how his activities influences other persons. So if you are if you are in a community, for example, you live in a community that has one toilet that has one bathroom. Now, if you go there to we and to pool, knowing fully well that this is a public toilet, as a system thinker, you keep it clean. You leave it cleaner than how you met it. But if you are not a system thinker, you do your thing and you walk out. So it means that that person is not thinking how his activities can influence others. So a system thinker is, is, is somebody who thinks, understands that his activities has a major role to influence others. It's very, very key. Now, System thinking is a holistic approach to analysis that focuses on the way that a system constitutes parts, interrelate, and how systems work over time within the context of a larger system. What I just explained is what this definition is saying. So it means that if you are a system thinker, you give attention to feedback. It means that you are always conscious of your environment. You are conscious of the people that work with you. As a system thinker, as a pastor, as a leader, you are conscious of the atmosphere you are working. So if anyone among your team seems not to be in the right spirit, as, as a system thinker, you understand that that person's mood can affect everything. So it means that when you belong to a team or you are part of a system, you, you can't just put yourself aside, knowing fully well that your attitude can affect the performance of a team. You know, when we had our guest speaker teaching on um, the law of the bad apple, that one bad apple can destroy many more apples. So it, it is, as a system thinker, who is a leader, you are always conscious of one person's attitude, whether positive or negative, that is
Tinka who gives attention to feedback because you understand that you are part of a process is something that is so important for us as we work in teams. How our attitude can, can affect others. And that is why in building a healthy team, we don't condone rotting attitude because if you do so, it will affect the whole system. If whatever culture you accept, we eventually become the culture of a team or of a system. So that is why when you have problem with any system or any organ in your body, it has to be dealt with, all right? If you have problem with an organ in your body and if it's not dealt with quickly, it will affect the whole body. So that's why as a system thinker, we are always conscious of each other's attitude and always wanting to make sure things work best. Now we look at benefits of systems thinking. There's so much benefits you, you derive when you are a system thinker. Number one from the list we have is that you become more effective in problem solving and planning. All right, when you are planning and you are a good system thinker, it will help you to plan adequately. You, you have to put the environment into consideration. You have to put the people into consideration, knowing fully well, for example, that if you are in an environment where there is no peace, so whatever idea you have will not see the light of the day. So because of that, you have to work on a peaceful environment. So that is how a system thinker thinks. But for some people, they will tell you it does not matter. All they are concerned about is about the program they want to do. So they don't care about what is happening around. So as a system thinker, it can also help you to solve problems. Uh, for example, if you go to, to any medical personnel and you complain of, of a particular sickness or ailments, they don't just rush and start giving you drugs. For example, you complain that you, you keep having headache every time, that you're always having headache. You know, the, a, a trained medical professional will not quickly give you aspirin or, para, or paracetamol or something that has to um, reduce the headache. Rather, it wants to take your history. Probably you are having insomnia. You don't want to ask how, how long do you sleep at night? You don't want to ask some other information to be able to help him or her solve the, the problem. So most people who are not system thinker, they attack issue from the surface. It's also very effective as a counselor. You know, when people come with issues in their life, they, they come to tell you the surface. A system thinker would like to probe into, into um, the root cause of some problems. And that's how a system thinker becomes more effective in solving problems. And then it also, it also helps in more effective organizational development. You know, when you have a, an organization with, where there is an effective system, it makes things work best and better. Now, when you are a system thinker, you, you think ahead. Now, this evening, it was so funny that uh, while the service of song was was ongoing, they were preaching the message and, and all that. The next thing to be done was to lay to rest the cops. So it was while we were there, we started chatting. Then we asked the person, where are the equipment that you need to lay the corpse into the mother earth? Honestly, they didn't have plan for it. So we had to send someone to please go and get some wood and some, some sick cloth. So the person left one hour. We couldn't get the person. I started calling the person to just 
know how things are going. The preacher finished preaching. Everybody sat down. We were waiting for a stick and cloth. We waited for an hour. We couldn't hear from them. We had to start looking for plan B. And, and you see, it, it, gave, it gave us a lot of concern. It, it created this, this, this organization. We, we, we didn't know what to do and all that. Why did it happen that way? The person that was organizing the funeral didn't think systematically. So most people, they will tell you, when I get to, to that bridge, I will cross it. You don't think like that. You plan what to do. So when you are a system thinker, it helps you to, to organize things. It makes things to flow. So the reason God created systems was for organization, organogram. So where there is system, there is order. System thinking helps to create order and reduce loss of energy when you have systems on ground there are things you don't exert energy to 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 achieve where there is no order then you, you exert a lot of energy last three weeks or so when pastor faith was teaching on pastoral care creating order he made mention of if you run a church and you don't think systematically, and probably you never thought of uh, the importance of the battery that the mic will use. So it is when you get to church on Sunday morning, you start looking for how to get battery. And that could be a major program that the church has planned and waited for, for months. But because the person did not understand how to plan effectively systematically. In some cases, the only battery available will be used for choir rehearsals on Saturday. And they will kill the battery energy, preparing for the program on Sunday. Then when it gets to Sunday, the guest speaker, before the guest speaker comes, the prayer leader will come, exhaust the battery the more, the prayer singers will come, exhaust the battery the more. And eventually, it gets to the time of the message, the battery is dead. What is the problem? The devil has started again. Africa will say the devil has come again. It is not just the devil. In some cases, it could be fear, like us here in Africa. You have one little fear in your gen, and you have a major program. You spend apple time wasting your, your fear when it's time for the main event your gen goes off. You say, oh, the devil has come. The enemy has come. It's not the enemy. You are not thinking systematically. A system thinker, it helps avoid complexity and vagueness. With, where there is system, there is no, I don't know who to do what. You are planning for a program in church up to who will take opening prayer. The people need to know what their function is. You don't wait till uh, it's time you, you start calling people. No, a system thinker avoid vagueness. You don't know what to do. Of course, there could be there could be situation where we have emergencies, where where you can barge at people to do some things out of the blues. But when it, when it becomes a pattern, everything just is just open. Nobody knows what to do. Everybody just come blank it ought not to be so a system thinker will always want to make things very simple and direct it creates a path for expansion everyone becomes effective and everyone becomes important in the key role there is also something i loved about system thinking is that it avoids founders syndrome system thinking helps you to avoid founder syndrome. As a leader, um, as, or as a founder of a vision, if you don't have system, everything will gravitate just, just around you. Everything, when you are not available, nothing works because you don't have a system on ground. Now, the reason why 
many of us have challenges in productivity is because we don't build systems. But to build systems is difficult. It requires patience. To build systems requires discipline, determination, and consistency. Because if you don't build systems and everything that happens happens around you, then the syndrome of the founder will always affect everything you do. So when we talk about founder syndrome, we're talking about when power is vested on the system, sorry, when power is vested on the founder and not on the system. So, but when you talk about founder syndrome, from the image you are seeing, the leader or the founder of the organization is the one at the middle. So what he does is that he, he, this founder releases power to different people. He gives them responsibility, he gives them role. One could be your job is to sweep the hall. The other one could be your job is to fix the mic. The third one could be your job is to ensure there is transportation. Now, now when the founder doesn't have a system that works, everything would be around the founder. So what the founder does, who is a system thinker, he divulges power. He divulges power. He ensures that responsibilities are given because the job of the founder is not to actually do the job, the assignment. The job is to release people into different assignments to fulfill the goal of why he's doing what he's doing. So many organizations today that are failing, they are failing because most of the time, everything about the organization is in them. So when they die, the secret or, or the productivity of the organization is dead. But where there is an, an effective system, even when the founder is out of the scene, things can still work out perfectly well. So when, when the test of a system is when the founder is not available, are things still going to work out perfectly well? The moment an organization feels the absence of, of their leader, it shows that the system is not strong. It shows so. It shows so. So you don't have to have the, the, the Reverend Father, all right, in a mask in a mass for the mass to, to be coordinated. So with or without the Reverend Father, a mass can, can be coordinated, all right? So you don't have to, to be there as a pastor for the church door to be open. You don't have to be there as a pastor for the members to, or for, for your workers to know where um, the instrument boss key is. So you must, as a system thinker, ensure that you create this order. That was exactly what God did. God didn't have to wake up in the morning and say, sun, come on, moon, go. God didn't have to wake up uh, um, and tell you, okay, it's time to weep, and God comes to press the button. Rather, he created a system in the human body. So how do we improve our system thinking? How? Number one, to improve your system thinking skills, you must learn to ask different questions. You know, the reason why people don't explore new ways of doing things is because they want to maintain the status quo. They want to do things the way they have seen it being done. As a system thinker, you must learn to ask different questions. Is there no other way these things can be done? Are there people that have done these things before? Is there anything I can learn from how other persons do such kind of assignment? A system thinker is not always satisfied with the status quo. He's always concerned. Oh, this thing is done, for example, in Italy. How is it done in Africa? Because 
you may have a cross-cultural audience to speak to. So if you are speaking just from one point of view, from one perspective, you, you may not be able to communicate that same idea act appropriately to a different audience. A system thinker looks beyond what is happening and wants to look for a better way to improve either communication or whatever he or she is doing. Also, to improve your system thinking skills, you must learn to experience time differently. It means that you must learn to share your time with different things. Number three, you must notice the systems around you before you can change or improve on the, the systems or how a system should function effectively, you must first observe what is happening in a system. A lot of people want to change a system they have not, they have not observed. So for you to be able to effect a change, you must first of all look into the system look at the challenges, look at the problem, and you will be able to provide an effective solution. And how do you provide an effective solution? You must first of all be able to create a system that will help you solve the problem. Now, the reason why we create systems is to solve problems majorly, to make problem solving easy. So when you don't check a system, how do you create the best solution for that system. So there are different types of systems one can find, different types of system. We have open systems, we have closed systems, then we have isolated systems. Open system. What is an open system? Uh, an open system is a system where everybody does what he likes a system like africa where anyone can create his own way of doing things and nobody queries it there's no standard there's no structure that this is how it must be done an open system is for example you are invited for for a special event and you are told you are told to dress the way you like that's an an open system an open system is a system where you can easily bring your your ideas to bear you are you are in an environment where your creativity your innovation is given an opportunity to express itself when you find yourself in an, in an open, open system, you have to be careful how you also um, bring in your ideas. But there is a closed system where your ideas are not needed. All they want you to do, do as I say. Whatever you know, keep it aside. So, so sometimes when you find yourself in a closed system, you should understand it. Do what they say, all right, and not try to create your own. Now, when you are in any system, you must first of all understand, like we said, to be a system, you don't just jump and start doing things. First of all, find, your, find out, is this an open system or a closed system? So if it's a closed system, then you must find a better approach to how you can influence that system. But if you find yourself in an open system where you are given the liberty to express, then you also find a better way to communicate so that you don't create problems. All right. Then we have isolated systems. Isolated system is a system where everybody works independently. Where what you are doing in prayer department, nobody interferes with what you do there. What you are doing in music department, nobody interferes with what you do there. So everybody is doing their own thing. There is no unity of purpose. That is an isolated system. 
Now, when you find yourself in such kind of system and you are trying to, to, to bring everybody together, you'll be frustrated. So you first of all need to understand, oh, this system, this is how this ministry operates. They are either in an open system where everybody comes together, share thoughts, everybody brings up their idea and they, and they analyze. Or you are in a place where it is only one man who sets the system, everybody follows. It could be in the church, it could be in the business world. It could also be in governments. Then you have an isolated system where what you do does not concern anybody. Do whatever you like. In as much as it's not affecting us, go ahead. So when you find such systems, you are able to contribute your quarter effectively. So don't forget these three systems, basically the open systems, closed systems, and isolated systems. Who is a system developer? Ooh. six times developer now this is why you are being trained tonight you are being trained to be a system developer now that person who is a system developer is actually the person who is like a builder a developer is somebody who builds who develop buildings you start from molding from after that you have to now start laying the blocks block upon blocks upon mortar you know you know until you are done with an edifice now as a system developer there are certain things you mustn't let go of your eyes which we call the systems building blocks number one to build a system you must set up operations. Number two, you must set up management. Number three, you must set up strategic leadership. Number one, you must set up operations. Number two, you must set up management. Number three, you must set up strategic leadership. Now, operations. Operations are the people who are going to be working, employing workers in the church settings, we call them church workers or ministers. The, the, the Austrian department, music department, prayer department, protocol, operations. Now they are the one carrying out the activities of the organization, all right? Operations, you must set up your operations constructively. Number one, you must learn to put round pegs on round holes. What that means is that, that you cannot put somebody who is an introverted person, a phlegmatic person, as, as someone that will be in charge of an extroverted event. For example, I went to a restaurant, very hungry, I place an order for a meal. Now it took the attendant almost, let me not um, say things that are not um, exact. It took the person almost three to five minutes to move from her sitting position to come take my, my order. Now, such person is not fit for that kind of job. If you want someone to be in operations or in any particular office or assignment, the person's temperament, the person's agility must match up with that assignment. It's like giving uh, some, the, somebody who is an usher, who does not smile, always frowning to be your usher, someone who is not friendly. That person's uh, mind that position will ruin the goal, the goal of the organization. So operations is very key. So most times 
when we do development training for organization, we handle their, their staff recruitment. We know that if they have a wrong staff, probably if they have a wrong teacher, it will affect the overall productivity of the school. So operations, you must be careful. So there are ways you actually uh, get people into workforce in the um, business world, all right? But, but in the ministry, the Bible has tells us what to do. First Timothy, second Timothy tells us that, all right, that a novice should not come into leadership, into work service in the kingdom. And a bishop must not, must be, must be patient, must be this, active to teach and all of that. So these are criteria we look at in certain operations. But above all, operations, people who are going to be functioning, they should be a people who are capable. Capability is in two dimensions, all right? Okay, we have mental capability. That the person having the knowledge of that work. Then we have character. So you can be gifted and not have the character for the work. It's like somebody who, for example, is, is a front desk officer. As a front desk officer, you have to have the, the, cap, the capacity to, to be able to think fast. But secondly, you also have to develop the capacity to be able to handle pressure. Because people will say things that will offend you. For, for some of us on social media, you know, you must develop both. Because sometimes your, your audience may say things that are stupid. And if you don't have the capacity to handle um, stupid things, you join them to become stupid. So that's why you see that when you are online, you have to become, especially when you are uh, discussing with people who probably are not in your community. It's not a church community and uh, you are having an, an open broadcast. People can call in and say nasty things. So you must develop the capacity. So operations is something you must set up. It's a block. Now, after getting the operations right, then we look at um, management. 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 The, the, the management team is a, a, actually the, the core leaders, the people that will help you manage the, the, the department, the operations, the, the ministries. All right. So if you don't set up a strong management team, hello, your operations will not function well. Whether you like it or not, people need to be monitored to perform well. Only that some people perform better when they are monitored, Why some perform better when they are not monitored. But there is always going to be a system where there should be a feedback system so that the man who is doing anything for the organization knows that he has to give a report. So a management team must be set in place. Some time ago, I did a study in my city that one of the most successful schools in my city, even in Nigeria, are Catholic schools. And one of their secrets is that they have a strong management system. They have a strong system that when you are late, when your child is late, in short, you can't even find your Reverend Father there. Once the gate is shut, it's shut. You see parents who find it difficult to go to church by 7 o'clock, but they take their children to school by 6.45 every day of the week because they understand that there's nobody to beg. Once the gate is locked, it's locked. Who do you call? Reverend Father or, or the Reverend Sister? So when you, when you want to build an effective system, you must learn to build a strong management team. Finally, because of time, we have to, to look at strategic leadership. Strategic leadership. When we come back from break, 
we will deal with that before going to, to the next slide. Thank you. So we, we looked at um, setup operations, setup management team, and setup strategic leadership. Now, the strategic leadership team are not the one who is in charge of management. Now, the difference between the strategic leadership team and the and the um, and the management team is actually in the vision and in bringing forth ideas that will move the vision forward. Now, strategic leadership team are people who actually are responsible in bringing up ideas. Now, they are like the visionaries. What they do is that you have to set up a team of people who observe the environment. You know, like, like the management team is to manage the people that are working. Why the strategic team are the team who observe the environment and they begin to provide solution. For example, um, you have an, an, an organization, you are functioning, you are, you are faithful, you are dutiful in what you are doing. Uh, but during the course of service, you, you started getting some feedbacks, some responses from the environment or from the people you are ministering to. So it is the role of the strategic leaders to create a system that we handle that. Okay, let me give you a very practical example of how that works. Okay, let's say you have a church where you have a church of 50 members. And um, over time, those 50 members, uh, out of the 50 members, only two persons had the car. Then over time, like 40 people now has, have a car it's obvious that you are going to have a new problem to solve. The problem will not be uh, how to park, how will your members park their cars. So somehow after church, you, you start seeing maybe the management team will start observing that there are problems. People start, start having conflict because of no parking space. So what happens is that the strategic team will not create a system, probably create a department that we will call traffic team, who will not be able to manage the, the space available for car parking. So it is the work of the strategic thinker or leaders to, to look at the best options or to create a system that will solve problems that will arise during the course of the meeting, during the course of, of service, during, during the course of function. So if you want to build a system, you must look at these three major areas. Because if you have a very dutiful operational team and you have weak management, it will affect your overall productivity. It's also true that you may have a very strong operational team, motivated team, and you have a very consistent and solid management team. Now, when there is no strategic leadership, that management cannot exceed its level of influence. So you always need a strategic leadership team who will not be involved in management, rather their role is to plan out possible solutions to address bigger issues. Then, who is the system thinker? And what are the, the blocks now that you have to put in these mortars? Number one, for you to build a system, you must first of all, have a purpose and a vision, what you want to achieve. Today, we are using the magical Zoom. Now, before this, application was released or before it was it was built 
first, there was a purpose, there was a vision. Now, a lot of people today, like I was talking to some children in their practicals, and I asked them, who made this dress? They said, and uh, someone said, I. I said, how did you make it? That I did this, I did that. I said, okay, what was the first thing you did? He said, I bought the clothes. I said, no. Someone said, no, I measured, no. So the first thing you did was that you had an idea. You had a vision. So you can't build a system without a vision. You can't build a system without a purpose. You can't, before you raise a building, before you lay the foundation of a building, it is the vision that you have for the building that determines the foundation. So the problem with a lot of people, they build systems without, that has no connection with their vision. Some, some couple of years ago, I was discussing with one general overseer and I asked her a question. You, the church, I think they are not up to 40 adults, but they have all departments. I said, how can you have, out of the 40 uh, um, persons you have in church, and you have about, about four, four of them who, are, who you can say they, these ones are born again and they are serving God. And now you have almost 10 departments. You have children ministry, evangelism ministry, protocol ministry, traffic unit, uh, uh, women coordinator, men coordinator, uh, what again, media, uh, I said, we do outreach. I said, ah, say, who is going to do all these things? You don't create department because you just want to create departments. So if you must create a system or a department in this contest, you must, you must have a vision. You know, I've, I also fell victim to that. Sometimes we say, okay, one person will do free job. So at the end of the day, it's not effective. Got to a time I told myself, I called all our leaders. I said, see, we have to, to scrap some departments. I'd rather not have a department that to have a department that is not functioning. I'd rather don't have a leader than to have a leader whom I know cannot, cannot deliver. So, so most times we create a system because we just want to create. We create a system because we just feel is, is, is good. At the end of the day, the purpose or the goal of the system being created will not be achieved. So you must have a vision. Before you create anything, it begins with a vision. I tell you. So what do you want to achieve? If you know what you want to achieve, then a system creation can be very, very effective. But if you don't have a vision, Jesus said, before you build a tour, won't you, first of all, come to the cost? So not just create a vision, you must have a strong, compelling vision. Some people have vision, but their vision is not compelling. Some time ago, I was listening to uh, one preacher, Samadeh, he said, it was talking about how the church will grow, people will be coming in, and the members were no longer happy about it because they felt when they have more people in church, they will lose their relationship with him. They wanted to always relate with him. They were saying that by the time we have crowd now, when, when we have crowd, we cannot reach you anymore. He said he has to change the concept of declaring the vision. He started telling them, that God is going to bring millionaires here. And among those millionaires, you will get married to them. You become millionaires. And say, yes, pastor. Yes, pastor. Now, the vision now, the people could see how the vision affects them. So your vision must be compelling. If you look at God, when God was, was leading Israel into the land of promise from Egypt, he was always giving them a vision. He calls it a land flowing with milk and honey. There's no history that the land of Israel, you, you will find milk and honey flowing from the ground. There's nothing like that. That was how God 
compelled them to leave Egypt. Sometimes we want people to function in the system. We don't help them to see the vision. So the work of, of a leader is to communicate the vision. Effective communication of the vision brings this compelling force. The Bible says in the days of his power, the people shall be willing. So willingness comes from understanding. Power is not just energy. Power can also be in the dimension of knowledge. So mission statement. You must build, you must ensure that people know what you want to achieve. The mission statement is actually how you want to achieve the vision. You must have a specific quantifiable annual goals. All right. We should know that okay, by the time we are done with this year, this is our budget, this is our target, then this is what we want to achieve. So that when, when you have a, a strong mission statement, it, then the next thing you will need to also work on is your structure. What is structure? Structure has to do with the department in the case of a church, all right? Then for you to, for, for your structure to be very, very effective, the law of planning must be put in place. The law of right placement, I talked about that before. The law of separation, the law of people development, the law of planning. So if you have a structure, you must ensure that you plan with your structure. If you want to put anybody in any position, which is the law of right placement, you must not compromise. Don't give people responsibility because they have been with you. No, put the right people in the right place. Joshua was made to take over from Moses, not because he was more gifted than others, because he was, he was right for that job. The law of separation. Now you must learn to separate roles and departments. When you give one person or two persons the same assignment, there, there won't be a clear structural work. Try to separate people's responsibilities and roles so that there will be effectiveness in service delivery. So as a manager, your job is to manage the people. It's not to serve food. That was exactly what we found in Acts of Apostles. The disciples of Christ said, we will not leave the word, uh, the word of God, our assignment, and be serving tables. He said, they said that we will give ourselves to the word, to the ministry of the word and prayer. So let Stephen, Stephen and others take the place of serving of tables. Then the final thing you must do to engage that your structure is standing is the law of people development. Please, you must develop the people. You must train them. You must engage them. You must ensure that even if they come in not trained, you must ensure that they are trained, especially if you have the resources to do so. Teach them what you want them to do. Let them know what they are to do. In short, as a matter of fact, you're supposed to have operational manual. How should ushers in your ministry coordinate? How do you want them to usher? Develop them. Take them to places where they can learn how to usher people into activities. So let's look at systems maintenance. Systems maintenance. You need, when you build a system, just like you have it and a car engine running, you have to do maintenance. You have to, you have to turn off the oil, change the 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 uh, oil and um, stuff and all that. You just have to maintain the system. If not, the systems will, will, will crash. All right. So most of us are, that have a computer, there are times you need to maintain your system by antivirus by scanning. So that some informations or some documents that are that are that have viruses can be can be deleted. So in a system, obviously there are times things will not go well. 
So you need to maintain system. Now, how do you maintain system? Number one, you must monitor your system. Always monitor the system. When I talk about system now, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about system in your computer. I'm talking about the human system. All right, you must continue to check in the context of church. You must check how are the ushers doing. The management team should be able to check because it can be so deceptive that the music team is doing marvelously well while other departments are not functioning well. So you must consistently monitor your structure, the process, and the content. Consistently monitor the structure, the process, and the content. Now, in the system, you must also understand where these three functions come in. The structure are, in the case of a church, the department. All right. Now, when it comes to process, it is how they are doing what they are doing. When it comes to content, it is what they are doing. The structure is who or what department. So you have to be sure of what kind of department you need in your ministry. Okay? Then if you have gotten that right, you have to consistently monitor it. All right. Now the structure, are they doing what they are supposed to do? That if they are doing what they're, what they are supposed to do, then you have to look at how are they doing it? You know, when we do um, um, some, some projects, all right. So when we do projects, oh yeah, we went out, we did some, some stuff, we did this, we did that, we did that, we did that. Then someone now ask a question, what you did, how did you do it? So when we talk about process, now we're asking now, how was it done? Was it done as it ought to be done? Then if you if you if you monitor that process, then you can tell if there is need for you to change some things. You can tell if there's need for you to to continue in that order or to challenge them to do better. Then the content is what you are doing. So, so you need to monitor all of this. In the context of a school, you need to check uh, the teachers, are they qualified? Then in the context of that same school, how are they teaching? Because you can be qualified and not know how to teach. You can know something and, don't, and may not know how to pass that information across. So the how is important. Then the content. What are you teaching? You know, this thing is very, very important. All right. Now, if you give somebody a content to teach, the person may be talking very well, but the person may not be teaching that content. In the book of Second Timothy, let me go there. I think I should read one Bible portion. Second Timothy. At least we are still, we are still, we are still in the Bible school. Even though this is a Second Timothy chapter two, let me show you something about Second Timothy chapter two, verse two. Are you there, please? Just help me read. Second Timothy 2.2. 2. I want one of the students to read. Can you hear me? Please, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Second Timothy 2.2. 2. Let me show you something from the book of Second Timothy. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. I'm reading from the NIV. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Amen. Thank you. Paul said the things you are heard, you have heard. So is, he didn't say God going to be teaching Timothy. He said the things you have heard. So Paul was concerned about the content. The things you have heard me teach. Because if you are a disciple of Paul, you should teach the content. So the things you have heard me teach, the same thing you are to commit to others, the same thing. Transmit it, deposit it. The instructions you have heard. Now, Paul has set up Timothy to be a bishop. He was the one there. Then Paul is saying, the things, the content that you are giving, giving out, it must be the right content. So, if, so you must monitor all this. Some time ago, I, it sounds funny, but it is true. So I have a colleague in ministry who had a branch. He said, one of the days he went to visit his branch church. Uh, he was there with his uh, branch pastor. So when he got to the church, got to the altar, he saw stones. People, there were so many stones on top of the altar. So he asked him, son, how far? Why, is, why are these stones on top of the altar? Uh, uh, he said, this, uh, the boy said, ah, pastor, ah, this is a stone that killed Goliath. I asked them to bring stones that will kill their Goliath. So they, they brought it for prayers. Ah, he said, he said, wow, this boy is not following me at all. That means you are just here in the branch doing your own thing. He said he, he told them he wants to close down the branch. So if, if, if the young man wants to go and start ministry, let him go and start. Because you can't be following me and, and be having a different content. So you, you must monitor it. Because the reason why we are failure in the Christian system today is because most times we don't monitor content. Oh, it's a big man, it's a big man. If you look at the teachings of the apostles, they were always concerned about content. Paul will say, whom we preach. Jesus is the person we preach. That's the content. So for your system to work, check what they are ministering. Check it. So finally, rules for effective systems. Rules for effective systems. A system is as assessed by corporate performance, not individual result. A system is assessed by corporate performance, not individual result. This one is very, very important. For a system to be effective, it's not about one person. Any system where it's only one person that drives it, that's not an effective system. It means that system is, is, have, is having a founder syndrome. So if that person is not on ground, the system crashes. That is not an effective system. A system that functions effectively is a system that functions without the, the leader. A system where things can go on smoothly without one person uh, you know, being noticed. What I mean noticed now, when it is very, very obvious, all right? Just for example, now we are still having to, to create a system for our Zoom launch, all right? Sometimes if I'm not there, we have to struggle. So we still need to create a system. How can we solve that problem? How can we solve it? Because if, if it's like that, it means in that area, we are not having an effective system. So these are rules. Then, Systems are driven with the overall vision and values of the organization and not just the leader's wish. 
when you are in a system, you don't wake up from your bedroom and start deciding what you want to happen to an organization. It must be driven by the vision and values of the organization. You don't just do things because it is good. You do it because it is connected to the vision of the organization. Yeah. So you don't say it's good. Probably you are saying to, to go and market some kind of product from your organization. And you found people who said, oh, I like it. I need it, but, but I don't have money. It's good to, to help, but must you give them? No, the, the organization vision is to make money. So giving it to them doesn't make it work, work right. So the values is what drives the organization. So you may have good idea, but if your idea does not support the vision. So if you have an, an idea to present, for example, in pastoral care, the question is, does it support the vision of pastoral care? That's where a lot of people will say, break away, break away. My point is not being taken. It may be a good point. Probably the place you are coming from, that idea works best because that is what that idea supports their vision. So you can't just jump at idea because it's working in, in, uh, in, in point A and bring it to point B. So don't pick values from other person's family and bring to your family, to your own relationship. You must check the vision. What do you want to achieve? What is the goal? of the organization. What does the organization value? That's what drives your system. If not, it will ruin, it will be ruined by one, one man in one day. Overall visions determines the process and the and as, as an acceptability of ideas. I've said that again, said that before. It is not what you wish. What determines if your idea will be accepted? is based on the vision, overall vision, not the founder's vision. You know, the founder's vision can be different from the overall vision. All right. So you don't change vision easily. You can only change strategy. So finally, discipline and integrity. You want your vision, your, your system to, to, to go through the test of time. You have to be disciplined to monitor the, the, the system, you must, you must also instill discipline in the structure. Then integrity, which means transparency and openness. That is one of the ways you can effectively build a system. So by tomorrow, we look at the three C of teamwork system. And um, then we'll wrap, wrap up with the Bible system thinking ideology. Thank you for listening today. God bless you.